you. Good evening, you all. That's what they say in the South. <laughs> but I'm not good at it, though. <laughs> I don't know how to do the y'all. <laughs> <y'all. laughs> oh, do we need to turn off the light? Or? That would help. to come here tonight and share with you our journey. Our, our oh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Again, uh, thank you for inviting me to this um, meeting um, and sharing with you our journey, our adventure in searching for mite-resistant honeybees. I joined I joined the, um, well, the, the leader of this journey is actually Tom Renderer. He is the research leader in our lab, and he's been a great mentor for me throughout my career. Without him, I would not be here today, for sure. I joined the B Lab in Baton Rouge in 1989 as a PhD student under Tom Renderer. And he assigned me this, he assigned to me this project, the Yugoslavian, can you remember the Yugo bees? Um, yes. You, yeah. Um, at, th- at that time, in 1989, when I got to Baton Rouge from Oregon, uh, we did not have Varroa at that time, only Florida. So I had to travel to Florida to do my research. I have almost every 10 days I have to drive there or somebody will drive me there because I can't drive that 13 hour drive so I'm act, I'm very very blessed to have a husband who was very supportive so he took care of our one year old daughter pretty much for how many years do so I can do my research in Florida and but unfortunately these bees are not that special when it comes to varroa mite resistance or I wasn't really good at, at that time, not still trying to learn more about varroa at that time, probably. Fortunately, they, these bees were released to the beekeeping industry, I guess in 1993, because of their tracheal mite resistance. There are very resistant to tracheal mites. I believe there's still one beekeeper who is using Yugo bees in the East Coast. Then comes the Russian honeybees. In 1997, we started importing uh, the Russian bees, uh, queens, from the far eastern Russia, the Primorsky region, up to 2002. In total, we imported about 362 queens, and all of them were tested. Um, in, we have an, an island where we, what we used, it's about three hours away from Baton Rouge. Richard, it's a good place to fish around. We fish around this area. Yeah. We love to fish. My husband and I love to fish. So, yeah, but out of the 362 queens, only 16% made through for um, uh, we for an extensive uh, evaluation. We evaluated Russian bees uh, in Iowa, where winter can be harsh. Also in Mississippi, and in Karen Crow, Louisiana, and then we have a setup in the lab. So we do the evaluations every month, so we are traveling every week. One week in Iowa, one week in Mississippi, one week in Karen Crow, and one week in Baton Rouge. So we we are rotating every month. So it it was very, very very extensive research. These bees were selected for varroa resistance, trachomite resistance, and high honey production. Each line for uh, all the Russian bees have or ha- 
has to have these three characteristics. If a line only um, is borrow resistant, but not tracheal mite resistant, then the, that particular line, particular line is out of the program. They have, all of them have to have all these three characteristics. In 2008, we transferred all the responsibility of maintaining and propagating the start to the Russian Honeybee Breeders Association. So if you need queens, you can, you can go to their website and find one member or contact one member and you can order from them. They, if you want to be a member, I guess they're still looking for members. The minimum requirement is that you have to own at least 200 colonies. <laughs> That's the minimum requirement. I guess you can do that. <laughs> Now, the, one of the negative comments about Russian honeybees is that they, they don't, they slowly build up in the winter um, for, especially for um, almond pollination. They don't like it because they're too small. Uh, in the winter, they have small clusters because these bees are resource oriented. If there's no nectar flow, they will shut down. But once there's a nectar flow, they're quick in developing. So well, what we did was to um, study, uh, to find some techniques or um, some management practices to enhance their performance. In this particular experiment, we compared uh, hiving them uh, using eight framer hives boxes versus 10 framers and also we have half of them were fed and half of them were not fed. Those colonies that were housed in eight frame boxes grew more than those hived in 10 frames. It's because of there's a we're talking about fall to winter, so it's lesser space for them to heat up. That's why they are, instead of giving more effort into heating up a wider, long, wider space, they're putting the effort in laying. So that's, that's the principle behind that. And of course, those colonies, whether they're eight framers or 10 framers that were fed, colonies uh, housed in eight framers, boxes and ten framers that were fed or grew more, of course, makes sense, right, than those that were not fed. So the temperatures are, um, the temperature in the environment in the winter. In, in Louisiana? Yeah, it can, it, it can go down to 20, 25. Yeah, especially, especially last winter, it was long. It was a harsh winter for us. Yeah, in this experiment, um, we look at the effect of colors, high colors, white versus black. Black, we, we thought that if we paint the boxes black, they will probably absorb more heat during a winter. And then some of them were continually fed, and half of them were uh, minimally fed. They were fed once throughout the experiment. Unfortunately, there's no difference between black or white. It doesn't matter what color. They're not racist. <laughs> so, but those that were fed, the colonies that were fed continuously, were larger in February than those that were fed once only. In this experiment, we compared colonies that were fed a mixture of pollen and pollen substitute versus those that were fed substitute only. We used B-Pro for this experiment. 
And the way we uh, fed them is by using the plastic, uh, these are super cells, frames, just, um, what do you call that? You putting them in, the, what's the terminology for that? Now pressing them into the super cells or in the form of patties. As expected, those colonies that were fed pollen of, of, did better than those fed with substitute Elbipro. But if you notice, yeah, this, see, there's, so the Russian bees can grow pretty large for pollen, for almond pollination in February. This is the average of 10 framers. I guess you need to have um, eight framers for almond pollination, eight frames. But this one went up to 10, uh, 10 frames. If you notice the spores, the uh, Nosema spores, it has the highest number of Nosema spores. Those were fed, that was fed with pollen. But the benefits of having larger uh, colonies in February must, um, might outweigh the expenses that you pay for treatment. But according to literature, most beekeepers use 20 million spores as a guide um, for treatment. So with this number, you probably don't need to treat for Nosema. Managing varroa mites, uh, we also did a one experiment um, looking at the effect of putting them under the sun or under the shade. Uh, we have apiaries of pure Russian, Russian colonies only. We have apiaries with Italian colonies only, and then we have apiaries with mix. Uh, we put Russians and Italians together. Those, um, a, those yards with ru pure Russians, they have lower levels of varroa infestations, as you can see here. But for the Italians, um, the, it, it's, really, it's really high, they're very susceptible, and it's more pronounced when they are under the shade. In mixed colonies, you know, the Russian bees in the mixed colonies, the infestation went up, as you can see here. This is the pure Russian and the Russian mix. The Russians in a mix yard went up. It's just like if you want to get sick, you go to the hospital, you know? <laughs> so this, it went up a bit, but for the Italians, it's still oh, very high. You know, in, in, the, in Louisiana, if a colony, Italian colony will go up to 25, that's Basically, it, it's, it's, she's done. That colony is beyond the decline. So what is the take home message from this experiment? Yeah, it's uh, better to keep colonies in the sun, and it's good for both tracheal mites and varroa mites. And in our area, it's also good for um, regulating small hive beetles populations. I think you don't have small hive beetle problems here, but it's pretty bad this year in Baton Rouge. Uh, our collaborator, our beekeeper collaborator uh, told us that it appears that the honey is also drier if you put them in the sun. That's what he, that's his report. And it's better if you separate resistant stocks from susceptible stocks in this is to avoid inv invasion pressure by mites and also to minimize undesirable drones for meeting with, meeting with your queens. Now I'm going to I'm gonna start talking about mechanisms of resistance. There are two traits used in breeding program, uh, the hygienic behavior and grooming behavior. Hygienic bees usually are, are able to detect and uncap and remove brood. 
they can also recap. After uncapping, they can also recap the cells back. The um, standard way, or the most uh, common way of measuring hygienic behavior is the use of free skill brood. This is the use of liquid nitrogen. Bees selected for the removal of free skilled brood, um, they're usually resistant to several brood diseases like American fowl brood or Europe European fowl brood. And this is the technique that Marlis Bivak had used in developing the Minnesota hygienic bees. But using this technique, it doesn't mean that the those hygienic bees are also resistant to varroa mites. We did, Bob Denke at the lab did some experiments and it doesn't equate to varroa resistance. So this technique is not recommended, I don't recommend it if you wanna select for varroa resistance. Varroa sensitive hygiene, the, this, the VSH bees were uh, is also one of the stock developed at the bee lab. And these bees are very resistant to varroa mites. It was uh, developed by John Harbo, if you know him. And he selected this uh, VSH for increased non-reproduction, non-reproductive mites. That's why you've heard about SMR. This used to be SMR because he thought that the bees are able to suppress mite reproduction. Then after a few years, they realized that these bees are actually targeting brood that are infested with varroa mites. That's why they rename it as VSH. Russian bees, oh, I did so two studies as well. Uh, using the free skill killed brood, and they are also hygienic to our uh, free skilled brood. And they support high proportion of non reproductive mites. The non reproductive mites has been very um, intriguing to me for how many years. So, uh, my student and I had did several experiments to figure out. Why bees are why the mites are becoming non-reproductive? So we tried to imitate two scenarios of hygienic behavior, hygienic activities. We collected mites from newly sealed brood, from pre pup as if we are uncapping them. So that's what we're imitating in this uh, in this experiment, from newly sealed brood, pre pup uh, white-eyed QP, pink-eyed, and also we collected foretic mites, and then transferred them into a section of brood, a uh, new, uh, newly sealed brood. And then we did, we did the reverse. We collected mites from newly sealed brood and transferred them in newly sealed larvae, pre -PUP, and white-eyed and pink-eyed brood. So we're just trying to imitate what happened to the mites that are exposed when um, bees try to open or remove brood. We found out for the first experiment, we only found 13% uh, of the mites were reproductive if, you, if we transferred them from newly sealed larvae to newly sealed larvae. The others, a lot of them uh, did not produce any progeny, or if they produce, they did not have, either they did not have males, or they have uh, females only. You know, only, female, only males or only females only. Or they um, delayed, it's a delayed reproduction, meaning that, um, those progeny uh, cannot reach adulthood when the bees emerge. The same thing with the second experiment. A lot of them did not reproduce. So 
we concluded, oh, no, a lot of this um, first, I dissected a lot of this non-reproductive varroa. It is varroa, they're small, but I dissected the Prispermatheca. That's the Spermatheca of the varroa, and these are the sperm. The varroa can have about 35 sperm. Yeah, yeah it's pretty tiny. Yeah, but it's, it's cool. <laughs> yeah. But yes, it's merely, so what we concluded is that it's just by that interruption, that by, by those hygienic activities that we did, the transferring, opening, transferring, it, uh, those activities interrupted the reproductive program of the mites. So it ended up, that's why it ended up, we're, uh, we're seeing incomplete mite development. They will not, there will be no mature female when the bee emerges. We, were, we saw the male in one, in the, uh, in the pre pupae there will be a, an egg which is supposed to be a male and then in the when we transfer them they only produce daughters so they they don't they don't mate they will not be mated so there's a lot of mating failure and if they remain sporadic for a few hours of uh, their you know the gravid mites their tummy is so big in just within a day their tummy will be flat it's because the, their body will reabsorb the yolk protein, and that bee will not lay again. The, uh, okay. the mite, I'm talking about mite. Yeah, the mite that will come from a newly sealed, oh, from, yeah, from a newly sealed larva is pregnant, it, we, we call that gravid, a gravid mite. But if it pre remains phoretic, if she cannot find a host, a suitable host, she will be phoretic for a few hours. What happened is that she will reabsorb, the body of the mite will reabsorb the yolk protein and then she will not be pregnant anymore. <laughs> that she will, yeah, that protein will be uh, reabsorbed. That's why they will not um, reproduce anymore, not until they find a suitable host again. We also studied the uh, ability of Russian honeybees to remove, to remove in brood infested with varroa mites. In this particular study, we painted some varroa mites so we can trace them um, uh, back. And also, when, when we transfer them in a section of brood, we, um, we map where we um, put them. So we know that that particular bee was inoculated with a painted varroa and that was removed. So that's, just, that's and we found that yes, the Russian honeybees can detect and remove brood infested with varroa. Italian did too, but it's more pronounced in the Russian bees. And it, they did it quicker, a lot quicker than the Italian bees. As you can see here, within two days, at least 57% of the deliberately infested brood were already removed, as compared to about 26% in the Italian honeybees. And after three days, it's already 70% in the Russian bees. But for the Italian bees, at the end of the experiment, it's just they only remove about 62%. So it's a lot uh, quicker for them to respond to mite threat. We also did another follow-up, but using two different techniques. This time we did not um, deliberately infest the brood. This time we, um, we took infested brood from highly infested um, Italian bees and put them in, in, the, in our test colonies. First we determined the initial infestation and then put those infested brood inside a colony and then afterwards 
the initial infestation. And then we came up with these numbers um, using this. This is the standard way of measuring VSH. That's what Bob Denka and John Harbo and then um, this, it, this is their technique. And we also use the actual brood removal. And for both technique, we found that consistently the Russian bees remove more brood. In this particular experiment, um, infestation of the, Italian, the Russian bees is pretty low, 6%. That's why we needed to pull a lot of brood to come up with um, more samples for us to statistically uh, analyze this data. And as you can see here too, they have 13% non-reproductive mites. This time, there are different ways to define non-reproduction if you read uh, some literatures. This time, we only considered those that did not produce any mite any progeny or offspring as non-reproductive. And it's higher in the Russian than in the Italian. And also recapping rate is higher in the Russian bees. So to summarize this uh, hygienic studies, we found that yes, Russian uh, colonies um, have high levels of hygienic behavior to our uh, brood that are infested with varroa mites and that hygienic activities you know, interrupts the program, my reproductive program, thereby increasing the pool of non-reproductive mites in the colonies, which contributes to the regulation or low population growth in Russian honeybee colonies. Grooming behavior, honeybees can clean themselves, and that's what we call the auto-grooming, or their sisters can do it for them. And that's the term auto-grooming. Oh. The use of grooming behavior as a, um, in, a, in a breeding program is really very controver controversial at this point because it's very, very difficult to measure. And because uh, the, the most common or the standard way for now, the most common way of measuring grooming behavior is by looking at the proportion of mites that are injured among the mites that you trap. But the problem is some, some mites that drop are dry, so they're brittle. So they're, they're, their legs can come off so it's easily, even if the bees are not grooming. And injuries can be inflicted by the presence of, of ants as well on the bottom, bottom board, and also wax moth. So that's why it's, it's really uh, controversial because we don't know whether the bees are doing it or not. And besides the level or the proportion of Injured mites, actually, uh, if you count them, uh, uh, if you examine a, a trap, you, you probably just see 20% of them are, or 10% are, are, and lower are injured. Mostly, they are uninjured. So, after the Russian bee, the Russian bees, we, what we, what we want to do next. So we're planning on breeding Italian honeybees that are resistant to varroa mites. However, the thing is we don't have a tool to do it. And Tom Rinder suggested that why not look at the traps. By evaluating all the mites on the bottom, on each trap, we are hoping to find a measurement that is related to resistance, and that can be evaluated using a single trap. And also, we're hoping that we can estimate the numbers of mites in a colony 
without even opening them. Isn't that nice? I don't have to go pop the lid and be stung, just grabbing a frame of root, sampling for a dope piece. So if we can do that by just uh, counting the mites from a trap, from a single trap, that will be great. So we started this project last year. And um, I guess two, two years ago, actually. And in each, in each trap, we collect all the varroa mites. We classify them, old, young, injured, uninjured, fresh or dry. And even we collected uh, the nymphs, the young. Very few of them, actually. Uh, you can only see one or two and a few of the males that we collected them all. And who will, and I end up, ended up examining each and every one of them <laughs> under the microscope. <laughs> this is, that's, the, that's the hardest part. The students can help me collect them from the traps, but they cannot help me examine them under the microscope. So this is uh, the first experiment that we conducted. We measured, uh, uh, we have 21 measurements for <coughs> this particular experiment. You can see younger mites, press mites, and injured mites. There are lots of injured, injured older mites, injured press mites, and everything. See this, all these graphs here on top here, these are, uh, it says, positive regressions, meaning that all these measurements are um, associated with the increase. Is it positive? So it's the increase of mites in the colonies. So the, all these measurements, younger mites, fresh mites. So what we need are measurements that have negative regressions meaning that they are um, associated with the decrease of mites in the colonies. So the best one that we found is the ratio of older mites um, in trap mites, what we call OT. It has 34, um, this is the R squared here. For the injured mites, it's, the score is 1.5. That's why looking at injured mites is not, it's probably not the best measurement for uh, grooming. These are the two bottom that I showed you from that graph. These are the two, the older mites, the ratio between older mites and trap mites. OT with R, R squared meaning this is the coefficient of variation of 30.34, meaning that 34% in the variation in the number of mites in the colonies is shared by OT. If you use OY, it's 26% is shared by O1. But if you look at injured mites, it's only 1.5 is shared by injured mites. So, so far from this experiment, the best indi indicator of reduced mite numbers in a colony is using OT. So we needed, we, we got so excited, so we went to do more experiments. We came here to California in collaboration with the Woodens. We used 100 of their colonies, and we went to Arkansas well, one of the members of the Russian honeybee programs who have about 10,000 Russian colonies. We use 100 of their colonies. <coughs> but unfortunately, if you can see here, we only collected, this is just a three-day drop. Um, we only collected 307 mites from the Russian bees and 1,500 from the Italian bees. So we need uh, to do this kind of experiment, we need more than this. So we get really sad when we saw this data, but we can still see a trend. You know, as you see at the bottom, these are the negative regressions. 
it's still OT, it's still at the bottom, very bottom. So we can still see the trend there, that OT is the best candidate measurement for grooming behavior or not in your minds. So it's time to validate um, the value of OT as an indicator of reduced mite population in, your, in the colony. So we did another experiment to validate uh, OT, the value of precocious foragers. Will they forage earlier or later? Or how many trips they will do in their entire life? How long they survive? And for the, um, for the drones, we are looking at the number of sperm and also the viability of the sperm. So, and I started tagging queens. I guess I have that uh, graph here, uh, Bonnie, that I was telling you. I started with the um, flight activities of queens. Uh, I monitored this using that barcode. This particular queen, here, Queen 4, she went out. I don't know if she made, because this, this she's just three, eight, three day old. That's about seven minutes she was out. And then she didn't, went out. She didn't go out for how many days? One, two, three. But on the 10th day, she went out again for about three minutes. And then on the 11th day, about 30, and then that's it. She laid eggs. That's pretty much it. For queen number two, she went out for about four minutes on the fifth day. On the sixth day, she did three flights. And this, this one, two, and three. And then she started laying after three days. For queen three, she went out when she's five day old, and then when she's six day old, and then seven days old for about 14 minutes, and then she started laying. She, she did not do any multiple flights within uh, a day here. For queen four, or, no, for queen, queen five, she did two, just one, a one day flight, mating flight, two, two flights in a day. We did not, we were not able to measure the duration here because with these readers, if the bee will come in or go out sideways, it will not read it. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have an in, we have a measurement for in, but we did not have a measurement for out. So that's why we put a question mark. But this particular day went out once. I mean, one day, but moved two, twice, and then she started laying. We dissected this queens. I'm known for killing queens now. <laughs> <laughs> so we dissected them. I guess queen one had about four million. Um, the spermatica, we dissected the spermatica, four million sperm. I can't remember now which one I only have 400. Yes, yeah, so I don't know, I can't remember now which one, if this one or, yeah, and then one has 1.5 million, so I, I don't know, but this were, I did this late, late, just a few, a few weeks ago, so there are fewer drones during this time. And I save, uh, I let them lay eggs and then save the first batch of workers so we can we will know through molecular technique, we will know how many drones they made it with. So I'm waiting for, yeah, the other graph is, uh, this is the flight activities of drones. So a lot of them flew between two to six uh, p.m. That's the peak there. I never thought, with the, I never thought that they will go out a little bit just even at 7 a.m., 9 at 10, I thought they will only go out this time. And see, it's not between 9 and 10, but they were yeah. just in and out because they're triggering the reader. By the, it's, the reader is at the entrance. So I don't know what they're uh, doing going out. <laughs> uh, the, see, that's 10 p.m., between 9 to 10 p.m. 
Night elves. Wow. <laughs> Nasty good boys. Okay, that's it. If you have questions, I guess I'm ready to. I guess we have a website. And you can go to publications and you can click, you can read them, you can print them, or you can email us, anyone of us, if you need copies of our uh, publications. There's no question, oh, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. So that the entire bottom board, are all those mites assumed to have been pushed out by hygienic behavior, or do they drop out? Grooming, you mean? Grooming? Grooming. Yes, yes, yeah. By the way, we use um, there are sticky boards. We use a mixture of vegetable oil and petroleum jelly. So that way, we can preserve the freshness, and we do it thick, so um, we don't have problems with ants getting into them, and they. Um, the, the freshness of them will is, is preserved. But are, I mean, they, uh, but yes, they, it's, it's probably mostly groomed by, by mm -hmm. the bees, yes. And they're also cleaning. If they clean, um, clean um, cell, some of them are still on the, within the cell, and they can remove that, remove it. Because I pulled my bottom board about a month ago and there were thousands, thousands of all large they were all larval stages, thousands. Oh, you cannot, there are no larval stages of mice. You mean the, the, the instars? Of Which, the yeah, the instars? Bees? Yeah. Oh, the you seldom see mice. them. They were you translucent. Yeah, they, were they so moving around? And then what? Really? Yeah. You, you look, yeah. so un under the scope? Yes, I'm like this. Yeah, okay, so that's probably from hygienic. They open first, they open brood, and then they clean it. They, they clean, so the, the jutonyms and the protonyms will drop, yes. And they all, all those instars come from within the cell? Right, they open, open. They, it will only come out, they, it will, they will only clean it if the bees are hygienic, and then they, they clean those cells for the queens to lay eggs again. Sometimes they will eat them because they're still soft. But the adult mite isn't. If it's left long enough and not removed, it'll become an adult in the cell. Oh, the younger ones? No, they will not. Um, they will not be left there. Bees will always clean that up. They will not. If they, it's not sealed, they will not leave. Uh, they will not leave. So that at a later time, like about seven months ago, I pulled that bottom board and they were adult. They were all adults. So the, they're coming they're both ways. They're coming from the removal of the brood or the phoretic mites, meaning they are on adult bees. They groom, the mites will groom and they will fall or the dead mites within the cell. As they emerge also, as they emerge, some of the mites are already dead within the cell, so they may be left there as the bees emerge, but the bees will always clean them, and they drop, they will drop, yes, yes. Do, uh, do the bees ever carry them out of the hive and they don't They drop? can, oh. they can carry them, and but this one have, um, they, this one have screen bottom, so, but they can carry mites on their mandibles and, um, throw them out, and they can do that. And do they die of natural causes of, you know, just old age, is that also a drop? It happens, yes, yeah, natural age, yes. And you can it identify happens. that, discriminate that. In right, that's why I'm looking at dry, uh, the freshness. Uh -huh. So when it's um, fresh, I, I have, when I examine them, I have needles, two needles, and I poke it. If it's, uh, the hemolymph will come out that's fresh, yes. I guess she, she seems first there. If um, if the gamma irradiation is going to attempt to eliminate bacteria, is there good bacteria that you don't wouldn't want to eliminate? In the brood, in the brood, I don't think there's good bacteria. In, I mean, in the comb, I don't think 
there's good bacteria. In the gut of the bee, there are. This is comb, okay. Yeah, but these are combs. I don't, I've never heard of any good bacteria in the combs. Yes. I guess it there's a lot, I guess the, okay. Yeah, you. Uh, so you did a study where you were measuring the amount of time that bees were foraging. Yes, that one, using what? the RFID. I know, you I know you haven't finished that study, you said so, but at this point, how long do you think these actually go out of court? It, it varies. Uh, sometimes they're out for 30 minutes. And the thing is, because uh, sometimes um, if I'm bored looking at my, mic, uh, my computer, I'll go out and watch them. So when I was sometimes a bee, a tag bee will come in and it's too, too busy because the, I only have two small holes. If the traffic is too, it's too bad, then they will stay in the, by the entrance for a while until they have, uh, it's free for them to go out. So that's taken, it's prolonging the data there. But most of the time, about 30 minutes. Sometimes it's just 15, uh, I don't know. And sometimes there are lazy bees as well. Sometimes a bee will not go out for two days. Yeah, I don't, I can't, then some of the bees, it just flew, went out how many times a day? It's long. Can you imagine? Um, I just, we just finished going through um, the data. And for a three day worth of data, it's probably, if you're, if you're familiar with Excel, that has 80,000 rows, just three days worth of data. Yeah, that's why for a three month, three day worth, I probably spend uh, two weeks just going through the transcribing the data. So I heard 30 minutes and I heard three times. It varies, it varies. It Sometimes it will, will, a bee can only, will only go out once. Sometimes two days, no, no, not going out. You mean go out once and then stay out or two or three it's, hours? It's stay then. inside. Sometimes they will not come back anymore. They they died somewhere. Yeah. So it's really amazing because I yeah you were getting all this data that I never thought there are lazy bees <laughs> <laughs> and these drones leaving early morning and at night. at night. I didn't know that. So it's yes, sir. If the Russians have this behavior, regardless of why it is, why are they? Why are they not being bred more aggressively and made available to the grooming behavior? Yeah, yeah. Why are there well, not more the Russian queens and like available? I mean, you said to get Russian. I think you said you have to have two hundred hives to get Russian queens. To be a breeder. To be a breeder. Okay. Are they commonly available? Are they being yes. Used commercially yeah. You, like but the, the thing is, you have to put in your orders ahead of time because they they don't really produce a lot because these breeders are not really into um, producing queens throughout for, you know, they're, they're only limited. I guess they only produce a thousand or a thousand, 1,500 each of them. Yeah, after that, they will no longer produce because they have other things. They have into honey production or making nukes. Yes, yeah, so you have to put in, like one of the uh, breeders that I talked to, January 16, I think, is the first you can call. Uh, you can call in your order. If within a week it's it filled up, I guess he has a limit of 1,500. If then that's it. No more orders. Maybe just one more question, Lily, and then if anyone has other questions, you can ask. Yeah, Richard. Uh, do you count light drop in 24 hours for the Yes. This. These are all 24-hour drop. And what's the most you've seen, or what's the top 10% of the worst? How many? Uh, for Italian bees, probably 350, sometimes 500. Okay. Yes, the highly, the highly infested ones. Yes. Yeah, I it can 40 be. 40 was getting scary. I've <laughs> had several of them. Yeah. 100, Okay, <laughs> especially towards uh, you know uh, towards October when the yeah. bees uh, 
are emerging and you know the production the egg laying had you know, slow the queen had slowed down slowed down I guess one more question or that's it no, no, we're here. Okay, one more. <laughs> <laughs> so which one <laughs> can one of which okay I have a question about the RFID chips whether yes. the, the weight of those might have any impact on the beauty's behavior it seemed like it would be a considerable portion of their body weight what was the weight I can't remember the weight they've been using it uh, quite often uh, with the pesticide studies so I think it, it, it it's not um, they, they'll be fine at first they will get used to it yeah when when I release these bees, they they drag out uh, a lot of them. Yeah, they don't like. They don't like. And when they are, I notice that when um, they are doing orientation flight, they took off and then drop, and, and then they will pull it, and take off again. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of glue do you use? The uh, super glue. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's tough. Yeah, it came with. Uh, we, I ordered the chips from uh, Germany, uh, and it, it, it came with um, glue, but it doesn't last. It, the super glue is better. <laughs> yeah, some of the tags it came off because we we see them right outside, right outside, the, and also on the bottom. So we started using super glue. It's it's. <laughs> okay, thank you again.